Come on up, Blue Foods panel. So um, what I want to do is I want to start out by asking you guys a couple of questions. So who in this room, raise your hand if you eat seafood. See a lot of hands up there. How many of you guys follow what's happening in the seafood industry or the storyline around seafood? Still a lot of hands showing up up there. How many of you work in the seafood industry? I got a couple hands in the room. All right, now how many of you passionately care about the future of food? Yes. That's what we're here for today, right? So we've got a panel of experts that are going to talk to us about seafood, the seafood industry, and where things are heading, what kind of opportunity and possibility there is around sustainability and the regenerative conversations we've been having in all the other industries, but take it into the water. So I'm Christine Root. I own an agency here in Denver called Socha. We're a branding agency that's really committed to telling the story of good food companies, the people who are changing the world through food. And we've got a couple of those folks represented up here on the panel, and I know we have more represented in the audience, but it's all of the work that every single one of you guys are doing to tell the story, to make the story possible that's actually changing this world. And so I just want to give everybody a high five and a round of applause for the work you do to change these conversations. All right, so introducing my panel here, we're going to start by having a couple of questions, um, Q&A session up here, and then I'm going to open it up. So please write down questions as you have them, because I want to invite you to come up to the mic. This can be a provocative story with a lot to talk about, and I want to give you guys space to share your, share your questions and get some feedback from our panel. Um, so first up, to my right, we have Dane Chevelle, and he's a fisherman and a co-founder of Organic Ocean. It's a seafood company based in Vancouver that's committed to sustainability and transparency of the highest order. We've got Chef David Standrich, and he earned his culinary chops along with two Michelin stars in New York, but now he brings his culinary expertise to the shipwright's daughter in Connecticut, where he curates a seasonal menu based on farm fresh bounty and local water from local waters and farms. And then we have Jennifer. Jennifer co-founded Fed by Blue to inspire activists, chefs, and visionaries to restore the vibrant ecosystems of our waters. And she is also the CMO for Quarry Arctic, where she works to amplify the importance of blue foods and the role they play as climate resilient foods of the, culture, of the future. So thank you, panelists. And I'm actually going to start with you, Jennifer, and have you tell us a little bit about what blue food is and why you see that as being an important part in the climate change conversation. Well, if you Google blue foods, it's blueberries, and we probably have Driscoll to thank for that. But, um, but according to the UN and the Food and Agriculture Organization, blue foods are defined as the aquatic animals, plants and algaes that come from both freshwater and marine based water. So when we think of blue foods, just to, to sort of leverage this up, three billion people on the planet rely on blue foods as their only source of food every day. That's a lot of people. All right, so tell us a little bit why, about why that becomes important when we think about climate change. Well, there are a number of things. I mean, the, uh, what I say is that, I mean, the, uh, the, our waters are 72% of the planet. We live on a blue planet. And so it's always interesting to me when we look at food systems conversations that we always lean towards the land and what we've known in terms of the farmers, of course, that have helped cultivate an amazing food system for us. But the reality is now is that whether it's our ocean or our waters, they're in trouble. We have had a consumptive entitlement to wild resources in fisheries for decades because there's been a very concerted effort to believe that farmed seafood is worse than wild. And I think that now we see that as the food system grows and what the fisheries and aquaculture report from the UN said was that this is the most sustainable protein in the world. We have to manage water production with water protection in order to have a, this be a part of the future of food. Absolutely. Mm. Dane, you engage with a lot of different folks in this industry. So as a fisherman 
and owning a company that provides seafood that doesn't just come from your own boat. Tell us a little bit about what the industry looks like from your standpoint and some of the key players, particularly the fishermen. When we started, uh, okay. Hello? <laughs> when we started Organic Ocean, we did so because we didn't have a supply chain that worked. <laughs> We're going to do this until we find a microphone that works. So just bear with us. Um, yeah, I was saying that uh, when we, and we was a, a group of uh, sustainably minded fishermen, established Organic Ocean, we did so because we couldn't find a supply chain that worked for us. The, the supply chains that we were selling into uh, would take our sustainably harvested, premium handled product and dump it in the same bin as everybody else's fish, and we would get the same low price. And uh, so my co-founder just determined one day he wasn't going to do that anymore and uh, he started selling to uh, the uh, uh, retail market on the fish sales dock down at False Creek in Vancouver. He got discovered by a chef and that chef uh, subsequently received the Order of Canada, which is like knighthood in our country, for his work in uh, evangelizing uh, sustainability in seafood. He, was, he also performed a tremendous service for us, and that is that he told three chefs, and each of those three chefs told three chefs, and before too long, we were selling our seafood, not just locally, but across the country, into the United States and into Southeast Asia, to guys like this. And uh, it enabled us to build a brand, and it was a brand that, among uh, other houses, uh, was built uh, uh, with Michelin-starred chefs. So, good story, fabulous story. What does it mean to the fishermen? Well, what it meant to the fishermen is that we were able to pay the fishermen a premium for their sustainably harvested, quality handled fish. Not surprising, we got a, a, a great following of fishermen who said, we like that, that's a terrific story. But it went beyond that, and we began getting approached by um, agriculturalists and indigenous fisheries that said, we've got this story. We said, we know the story. Um, we, uh, we wrote, the, we wrote the, the movie and starred in it. And so we really migrated from purely wild capture, capture fisheries to a platform that included and incorporated uh, uh, indigenous fisheries and uh, responsibly, and a term that is used frequently today, uh, regenerative ocean aquaculture fisheries. And, and the cool thing from our perspective, and also from the chef's perspective, is that when fishermen come calling into a restaurant and say, we're here to promote um, this fish, they expect naturally that it's all going to be wild captured fish. But we say, no, we're also here promoting shellfish or we're promoting seaweed and kelp. And we have an immense trust factor uh, with, with uh, the client because the thing is, is that who, who else could you trust better than a fisherman if he says this is a good thing, then it becomes a good thing. Doesn't mean we don't rely on third party certifications, we do. But increasingly, um, it's, I think it's been our reputation, our brand, and our marquee following that has uh, led to our credibility with the market. Absolutely. Do you want to pass that mic over to David? David, I'd love to hear, um, following up on what he just mentioned and that storyline of as he's coming into you, as fishers are coming into you with product, what are you looking for? What, What's important at the restaurant level? Uh, for us, obviously, well, the one thing, in my experience, we don't get fishermen coming into the restaurant, unfortunately. I have to go and find them and hunt them down and corner them and, and try to get their product. <laughs> but uh, what we're looking for, um, from the restaurant perspective, is, is a uh, very high quality product. We want the freshest product as possible. We want it to be out of the water for as few days as possible. And we want as much control over it as possible. So I, we always try to get whole fish because we want to be able to manipulate it ourselves. Um, and I think that kind of translates into what the guest is looking for, which is totally different. Um, and that's sort of the, the challenge for us, that, you know, as a chef in a, in a restaurant, we get to influence both sides, which is wonderful that we can go to our fishermen and our distributors and kind of demand better practices, better quality controls, uh, specific products from specific places. And then also we have the ability to sort of influence the diner by putting things on the plate that they've never seen before, like you know sugar kelp in a dessert, um, and get them to break down those barriers that are holding them back from buying the right products, um, which I think is really the major challenge that we have in trying to get more blue foods out into the marketplace. 
Absolutely. Well, one red flag you just mentioned to me is that the farmers aren't looking to you guys to be an advocate for the work that they're doing and the story that they've got to tell. But you do have a pivotal role, and I think that's one of the really exciting things about food in our culture today, is that there are so many different people who can be carriers of that story. I mean, talk about trust factor. You just mentioned it, Dane. Right? You guys are out there in the water and building the trust. You know, you're, you're seeing it. You're doing it. You're working with wide groups and communities to make this possible. <clears throat> Carrying that trust factor. It's, it's a personal relationship at some point. Do you, do you guys want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the thing that's really interesting is that we, I mean, fish and seafood and, and blue foods have been part of our cultural narrative pretty much from the beginning. And, and we, and the, ama the amazing thing about this is, I mean, we can tell stories of King Kamehameha farming Kampachi off of the coast of Kona in fish ponds because they had a food security issue because the fishery moved and he was so concerned about his tribes throughout the Hawaiian Islands. Now today there is a farm called Blue Ocean Mariculture that's farming that same Kampachi in a sustainable way off the coast of Kona that's available in the U.S. And it really to me connects the past with what the future can look like if we're giving honor to that heritage around fish and seafood. Now, why we haven't told the story, why the supply chain has been blind around it, I think is partly because it's confusing. It's really easy to walk up to the, the um, chicken section of the market, the beef, the, the pork, and you only see beef and pork and chicken. People know what that looks like. There are 3,650 different aquatic foods that we eat in our food system today. So it's confusing. And I think that Dane could tell you, or David could tell you, that when we're trying to tell the story, it's, it's long and it's lengthy and it's confusing and people want really easy, short answers and they kind of end up loving what they love, right? Wouldn't you say? I mean, they want to eat the things they love and it's hard to express the good work that's happening on the water and there is a lot of good work, both with farmers and with fishermen. So understand, there are great farmers, just like you can farm chicken well, and you can farm chicken badly, and you can farm beef well, and you can farm beef badly. Same is true for the water farmers. And they've been around and they've been contributing for hundreds of years. Yeah, I think it's definitely true that people are in their comfort zone, and that, that's one of the big challenges, is to break it out. I was just talking to my mother this morning, and she was talking about the only fish that she's comfortable cooking is salmon. And that's just one, and that's why she doesn't buy other fish, and that's a something that we can kind of do in the chef space and we work with organizations like Eating with the Ecosystem that does a tremendous amount of educational outreach of just teaching people how to cook the products. Um, and whether it's introducing them to new species by sometimes not giving them any other options and then kind of breaking down that sort of reticence and then also providing the education at home. Even companies like yours, whether it's recipes or engaging with chefs to kind of help promote their products, I think that's really important. You mentioned uh, our relationship with the chefs and how that has uh, benefited us, but um, our relationship with the chefs has, has uh, benefited them as well. And it doesn't extend in the restaurant just to the chef, but it goes right down to uh, the level of the server. And that is when we go into um, a, a kitchen, we're talking about where the fish came from, who caught it, where they caught it, how it was caught. And we can really speak to the provenance of, uh, of the fish. And we're communicating that to the chef, but similarly we're communicating that to the servers. The servers in turn are communicating that to the clientele so that when you go into a good restaurant that serves our fish and they go, this high decor albacore tuna in here, what does this mean? And, and the server goes, well, this is harvested in the far northern uh, migratory uh, range of the albacore tuna. Uh, it's colder water. Uh, the forage fish they feed on are fattier. And what you're going to find is it has a more buttery type of uh, taste to it. And so the patron buys the, or orders that, has it, because it's phenomenal. And when they leave the restaurant, they no longer have had albacore tuna or even high decore tuna. They've now had organic ocean tuna. And it's done, you know, significant, or presented significant value for us in building our brand. We're able to leverage that in a direct-to-consumer channel because now the home consumer that, like David's mother here, who is confused, can go, I can go to the same place and get the, the same seafood that David is serving in his restaurant. If it's good enough for him, it's certainly good enough for me. 
and we will get David to provide some recipes and some cooking tips so that when people like his mother hit our website, they're no longer spooked by the complexity of the seafood. I love that. So storytelling being an element of how we can break down some of the complexity of an, in this industry. What other actions are being taken right now? Maybe Jennifer, you want to kind of lead the start on this, but what other actions are there out, now, out there right now that are trying to break down the complexity of understanding seafood so that consumers can get a better handle on it? I mean, obviously, part of it too is that, you know, building a brand, consumers love brands. So, Quarry Arctic, I've been asked, you know, why would a salmon farmer be here today? And I mean, and I really commend Tracy and the Edible Communities team because it's taken almost a decade, over a decade, to get to this moment that we're in right now. This is a third generation family farmer that's been farming in the Arctic Circle for 50 years and they were fishermen to start with that went back 10 generations from a island with 80 people, 23 of whom are children. And so they first started farming salmon because of food security. No antibiotics, no crazy feed models. They were one of three farms in all of Norway trying to figure it out. And then that evolved into building the Whole Foods Market sustainability standard for Atlantic salmon, and there are one of only four farms in the world that farm salmon. So building a brand and having that storytelling is, is really important for us because what, what our CEO said was that if supply chains are blind and in fish and seafood, fish and seafood changes hands more times than any other food in your supply chain. It's eight to nine times on average. No wonder why there's mislabeling. No wonder why there's confusion in the store. Because there isn't a brand and there's really no way to trace it. And what Alf Guren said was, we have to let people know who we are as people and have our story told. They originally sold their salmon to Whole Foods through Blue Circle. How many of you know Blue Circle Foods? Almost everybody, because they sell a lot of seafood into Whole Foods, and made the decision to invest in a brand, and on February 1st of 2020, launched their own brand that told the story of an island called Quare in the Arctic Circle. The other thing is you should know is that there is very rigorous, are very rigorous changes that are happening within the certification and recommendation space. So just like they were talking about fair treatment of animals and some of the things that we've seen really moving forward in the beef and in the pork industry for decades, right? We hadn't seen that in um, aquaculture specifically as well as wild capture fisheries. That's changing. Um, Quarry Arctic, and it's funny, somebody on a panel said the national car bumper. Quarry Arctic, we say that all the time. So they are the first ever aquaculture fin fish that's raised to be fair trade certified. First ever certified by the American Heart Association, Global Gap, Best Aquaculture Practices, Aquaculture Stewardship Council, Seafood Watch, and Whole Foods, and the IBM Food Trust blockchain, so you know it is what you're getting. I think that it's the most sustainable salmon in the world, and more we belong to all of those and pay for all of that because we want the industry to change so there's more transparency and more alignment between all these certification and recommendation bodies. It's confusing, and we know it. And I think that you have to have best-in-class farmers like Nyman Ranch and like Quarry driving change in the industry so that consumers can feel better about where their dollars meet their values. Dane, your, can you speak a little bit to your kind of pioneering a transparency effort right now? Can you tell us a little bit about some of the work you're doing in transparency with seafood? Sure. You, when you talk about our pioneering work, uh, I think about our pioneering work in sustainability, and uh, I like to say that we were into sustainability before sustainability was cool. And uh, when uh, we started this journey, we would show up at an industry meeting and start talking about sustainability, and uh, the other people in the room would look at us like we had just arrived in a Volkswagen microbus with a goat in the back. But uh, I'm pleased to say today that Everybody is sustainable, and, and it's unfortunate because it's losing some of its, um, I think, meaning. Uh, you don't know who to trust anymore. Uh, and even pointing to the uh, third party uh, certification and procedures controversy that swirls around, around that. So we've been trying to take it to uh, the next level. We're the first, and I think the only company in the world that does uh, DNA 
authentication of our uh, seafood. It's not every piece of fish is DNA authenticated, but we subject ourselves to a random audit, and uh, the results are published uh, online in a tamper-proof fashion, and if we're offside, it's there for the world to see. And we're not always perfect. And there are some fish, because their morphological characteristics, their head, their fins, their scales removed, they look very much like each other, particularly when you're talking about um, species of, of whitefish. But that's what we're attempting to do, is we're trying to um, raise the standards. We're one of the few signatories to uh, uh, global uh, mislabeling campaign to try and raise labeling standards so that uh, you can't uh, miss uh, uh, identify fish. Um, it happens um, frequently in, uh, in North America where you see red snapper and it's red snapper all over the place but there's not very many yeah, red snapper and there's only certain sources of red snapper but it's just one of these things that it's an abuse that uh, um, industry has gone away with and it's interesting because most of industry and most of the regulators are just, no, we don't really want to go there. It's a, it's a, a difficult, prickly type of space. And what we find is that we're in cahoots with the NGOs. They seem to be leading the uh, charge in terms of raising the standards for um, food production and uh, food identification. And technology is so important. I think probably in fish and seafood, technology has been used. I mean, what's happening now, Google has gotten involved with AI technology on the farm where we can individually identify a fish on the farm and be able to rear it according to its individual needs. And so this is something, I mean, every fish has its own individual footprint, fingerprint on its head. And Google's gotten involved with that, also with um, projection mapping around ocean projection so that you have modeling of what's happening with oxygenation and algae and all these things from predictive models from the past looking at the future. So technology, I think probably aquaculture is one of the fastest moving industries around technology and the use for improvements than almost anything in our food system at this point. It's really fascinating. What do you hear on the front line as you're talking to consumers in the restaurant in terms of what their, what questions do they have about sourcing, about seafood, about sustainability, about, you know, are they aware? Are they interested? Are they just confused? I think they're aware and interested. They're definitely tremendously confused. Um, I think, depending on where you go, but there's certainly a huge debate over farmed versus wild, which is better, which is uh, healthier, which is better for the environment. Um, I think the one thing that we really do lack in the seafood industry is, is some any kind of clear labeling. Um, even though it's definitely very flawed in the meat industry, like USDA Prime means something, you know, organic means something. Um, and especially in the wild caught sector, there just isn't any terminology that we can use to, to express the quality of the fish. Um, or, or really even like clearly its origins or catch method. And then I think that the um, sort of other not official regulatory bodies like Monterey Bay and Seafood Watch, it can be, it's confusing for me. I mean, it comes down to things as nuanced as how did they catch this fish? And that I think once you get within outside of 20 miles from the dock, that information is completely lost. And there's just really no way to even know. And what we're kind of feeding, um, interested consumers with a lot of questions to ask that no one's going to have the answer to. And so I think there's just, that's very, very challenging. Yeah, I mean, Google right now, I'm really excited about the fact that they have actually funded a connected market tool that hopefully in the next couple of years, David will be able to go in and be able to find it. So he might say, I'm looking for a fair trade certified tilapia from women farmers from Africa. And you're going to be able to find something like that. Not that you would in a local restaurant, but do you know what I mean? Like, uh, what's interesting about fish and seafood to understand is that the majority of the information that we get comes from the distributors. It's the most trusted point of sale. And a buyer in fish and seafood spends less than 18 months in their job. So just realize that when you have a depth of information that you've got to pass on and, and this job keeps turning over, it really gets muddy and very confusing quickly. Absolutely. It sounds a little overwhelming. I think taking a little bit of a leap, uh, one thing that I found is a very alarming statistic as I was reading up on this is that 47% of seafood is lost to waste. 
Let's talk a little bit about where that happens in the supply chain um, and what that looks like. Anyone want to take Yeah, I'll just, I'll just jump in on that really quick. Um, I was recently talking to um, the people down at the docks where I get my seed food, and you know, this waste happens all across the board from the time the fish is caught to the time it's served on the plate. There's a, 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 a constant cycle of waste that happens. Um, and I was happy to learn that on the docks, all the seafood that's processed, everything that's not used is used. So everything that's not shipped off the dock is used another way, whether it's bait for lobstermen or if it goes through fertilizer, there's really not a lot of waste in that process. I think there's a tremendous amount of waste once it leaves the dock. And there's just this attrition every step of the way where fish go bad, fish are wasted, they're not handled properly, the logistics of the, of the channels that it travels through are just inefficient and not working particularly well. Um, Especially with fresh fish. I mean, I just had this same, but not to keep bringing it back to my mother, but <laughs> it lives in a landlocked state and is buying fish in the grocery store that's fresh that was previously frozen. And I was asking, like, well, why would they defrost it? It doesn't make any sense. Now it's going bad. You know, and, and, but there's these little silly things that happen, and it's all based on this conception that we want to buy our fish from a case with the fish laid out, covered nice, and it pretend that it just came out of the water. But that's almost never true. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> I, I, I talked to our, our chief culinary officer uh, about this very subject because, not surprisingly, we were uh, prompted as to what kinds of questions might come our way. And so I said to him, uh, Chef, uh, I think that, uh, I'm going to have to field a question on uh, the, uh, the loss of, uh, uh, and lack of recovery on seafood. And, uh, he started waving his hands in the air, and uh, spit was flying from his mouth again, because it's clearly one of the things that disturbs him the most. And he said, one of the biggest problems is the fact that there is this fixation on fresh fish. And he goes, it's a, he's been on a one-man campaign to deal with that, because uh, the truth is, is that frozen seafood is not only in every, in almost every case is high quality as fresh seafood, in many cases it's even higher quality. And I can tell you this you know, from uh, my own perspective. When I'm commercial fishing, I fish with ice. I sell fresh fish, and I sell fresh fish to my own company. But I'll be out at sea for four or five days at a time. I'll put those fish on ice, then I'll deliver them. It takes me about a day to get into Port Edward. Then in Port Edward, they're offloaded, and then they'll be trucked to Vancouver. That'll be another 16 hours. And then from Vancouver, they'll be thrown on a plane and sent out to a market. could be anywhere in North America. Well, it's now been eight, ten days since that fish was caught. And that's still much fresher than most of the seafood that you're going to find elsewhere. My partner, who freezes at sea, catches the fish, bleeds the fish, eviscerates the fish, washes the fish, you know, glazes it, glazes it three times, and is freezing it at uh, minus 40. I know his quality of fish is better than mine. And so, uh, that's, that's been one of the things that we've been trying to impress upon chefs is that if you're dealing with frozen seafood, you're going to uh, address much of the waste issue and you're going to, quite frankly, end up with a higher quality product. Yeah, I mean, we have a, I have a phrase um, with Fed by Blue, frozen is the new fresh. And, um, and this has been driven a lot by the state of Alaska. They have really um, figured out how to advance freezing technology. Same with um, the country of Japan. And there are a lot of best-in-class companies, I'll lean on Google again, where they actually have a, um, a mandate that they cannot supply an ingredient into their kitchens that comes from more than a 150-mile radius away, which eliminates a lot for a lot of the areas where their campuses are of uh, the fish and seafood opportunities for them to bring in. So they worked with um, the country of Japan and the Ministry of Trade, Aquaculture, and Fisheries on advancing freezing technology. We did a tasting with Michelin star chefs and we did they didn't know it was a blind tasting frozen versus fresh and the chefs all thought that the frozen was the fresh fish and it has to do with how you how you actually thaw it etc cetera, etc cetera. I mean you can eliminate a lot of waste just that way because you're only taking out and using what you need and most of your readers think that if they fish and seafood is a luxury which is a problem 
because we eat less fish and seafood. We're 17th in the world in fish and seafood consumption. We eat 12 and a half pounds of fish and seafood, the most nutritive food on the planet, and 35 pounds of avocado and over 100 pounds of beef. So it's really something that we don't do because we're afraid to cook it. We're afraid it's going to go bad, and that's part of the problem. So it's one of these things where we have to re-educate around frozen seafood. We have to talk about how much better it actually can be and get people to start sort of, my thing is a sea pantry. Keep these things in the freezer. Tin seafood is bringing, is coming, making a comeback. Delicious tin seafoods, um, the canned seafoods from all these great companies so that people feel like they can stock fish and seafood items up. They can have seaweed in the pantry and then cook from it in the same way that we think of an Italian pantry, and we used to think it was so fancy to have olive oil or balsamic vinegar, we have to think of our seafood pantry items like that so that people will utilize them, cook from them, and start to see them as something that they can lean on as, as the answer for what's for dinner. Um, I, that's, that's awesome. I totally agree with that. And I think that it kind of brings to mind something else that we have this need for brands and national kind of guidance and we're trying to put this out for everybody. But I also I think the idea for me is strengthening regional food systems and understanding that depending on where you live and what your your geographical location is, you should be eating differently. It's not one size fits all for the entire country or the entire world. Obviously, you know, for me, living two miles from a commercial fishing dock doesn't make a lot of sense for me to buy frozen when I can get the best possible fresh fish. But for somebody, and that's what I tell guests when they say, what should I get, what should I buy? You know, the first thing we say is local, because we want to support the local industry. And the second thing is I have a list of species that I want you to ask for, most of which they won't have, but maybe if you ask, they'll get them. Um, and then if you live further away, that changes very, very quickly as you get further away from the coast, where we probably should be asking for frozen fish. We should be asking for farmed fish. And I think that this one-size-fits-all model of eating um, is, just doesn't work. I just want to say, too, from a carbon footprint perspective, so the, the carbon is, the emissions are 10 times higher for me to get a fresh fish off the dock in San Diego, bring it to San Francisco and sell it, than it is for a container ship to come from Japan with a frozen filet on it and then utilize it in a restaurant in San Francisco. So it's, I mean, it's, it's a tenth of the carbon emission to have fish and seafood coming. So if it is, and, and I agree with David, we have to look at these local food systems and figure out how we're going to support those. But in these food deserts, if you, want, if you think fruits and vegetables are lacking in a food desert, I can tell you right now, there's zero fish and seafood for kids that need omega-3s and access to these for brain development, and, and we're not even getting it to them because of the issues around price and supply chain. There's a lot going on in this space. <laughs> and there are some things to get people fired up about. It sounds like one of the pieces that we've just uncovered is the education needed between fresh and, fresh and frozen and what that looks like. Another piece is around farmed versus responsibly caught. So, you know, we, we heard from our beef farmers earlier today that raising cattle um, in the current system, an 100% grass-fed diet has some significant challenges around it. It produces barriers, it creates a really messy system. Um, when we look at that and how that translates to the seafood industry, what kind of things are our, our fishermen experiencing? Whether they're, they're the farmers who are you know, farming fish or the wild-caught fishermen, what things do you see that they're experiencing that play into the challenges from their perspective? Or, is the momentum, if we could just get consumers to understand, if we just rose the IQ of our consumers, are they at a pace, what I've seen par in parallel in the 20 years I've been working in food sustainability is that we can't just have a farmer do the right thing. A fisherman can't just do the right thing. Because if a farmer went out there and grew broccoli and he paid all of his employees fair living wages and he gave them things like health benefits and sick and paid time off, opportunities. That cost of that head of broccoli is going to skyrocket. The consumer is going to go to the grocery store and they say, oh my god, I'm not buying that broccoli for five dollars. So we need education on both sides. What I'm trying to kind of get at is what does that look like when we think about 
the, where are the farmers sitting right now um, and, the, and the fishers sitting right now in that conversation? Are they, are they facing a lot of struggles to be able to provide better for you seafood, better for the planet seafood? No, I understand where you come from now. Um, in, in wild capture fisheries in, in particular, we have uh, increased monitoring and compliance standards. And, and essentially what this enables uh, the industry to do is it, it enables us to know what, what's there so that we know how much we can safely uh, harvest. Um, you, it's very difficult to manage it if you, if you can't count it. And so we have fisheries now that uh, require electronic monitoring, fisheries that require uh, validation when the fish are being offloaded, fisheries that uh, are managed to quota systems. And in almost every instance, the fisherman uh, is paying for that. So that's obviously adding to, to the cost. Now, from the consumer's perspective, um, is the value uh, uh, acknowledged by the consumer? Probably not. So it does mean that the fisherman or the harvester is uh, contending with uh, a narrower margin. Why do they do that? Well, it speaks to the sustainability of the fishery. Why is the fisherman interested in the sustainability of the fishery? Because like the farmers that you've heard speak here, many of them are multi-generational. They're bringing their kids into the industry. Their kids are bringing their kids in the industry. And if we don't do it responsibly, there will be no industry to be brought into. So it's, it's a price that we pay. And, and we believe that we ultimately will be rewarded in the market, and if not in the market, in heaven, because we did the right thing. I think, too, from perspective, there are 4.1 million commercial fishing boats in our ocean today. 4.1 million. Our ocean is 90% either fish to or over capacity. Now the Magnuson-Stevenson Act and, and certainly a lot of our waters are being very well managed, but the rest of the world isn't necessarily behaving in the same way. So, and only 54% of all of the fisheries are actually under any sort of assessment scheme. So that's very small. So groups like Seafood Watch, they're not worried about the salmon farmer anymore because if we're farming salmon, they're pretty much going to know and probably Aquaculture Stewardship Council is going to sweep around and get that assessment in. But Seafood Watch is focusing on the unassessed because it's a big world out there and we're not fully aware of what's going on. And given the chance, I always say it's like a bowl of popcorn. Do you ever eat two pieces of popcorn? No we always end up eating the whole bowl of popcorn. And as the food system gets stressed, things like places like Africa, where we know that they're gonna be four billion of the people on the planet in 2050 will be in Africa. And when they have coastal migration, remember what I said in the beginning, our waters have acted as the biggest food bank in the world because you can still go out and fish for your dinner and they will eat out their fisheries in a minute when other land-based issues arise. And that's why we work um, with women farmers in places like Kenya to teach them to use insect larvae to, to be able to grow tilapia and catfish because aquaculture, according to the FAO, is the most important food system solution that we will have. Just read the 2022 fisheries and aquaculture report, number one. And, the, and from a carbon perspective, blue foods wild or farmed is the lowest carbon footprint food you can eat. It's a fifth of the carbon emission than your plant-based burger. So realize it's gonna be there. We have to stay in the fight. And we know that like the menu items like David's with the seaweed, if you do nothing else, Number one farmed seafood in the world is seaweed, and it's mostly women. So teach your readers how to eat seaweed because it is so important. It regenerates um, its ecosystems. It attracts fish, more fish. It actually lowers nitrogen levels, lowers pH levels, regulates temperature. And I mean, if we're going to have a movement, it should be around seaweed because it's going to be a significant part of our food system moving forward. More seaweed will be produced in the United States by 2035 than potatoes. That's pretty powerful. All right. We're running low on time. I want to make sure that if there are questions bubbling up for you guys out there in the audience, this is a dynamic conversation. There's a lot we still haven't gotten into. But what things are bubbling up for you? Does anyone want to come up to the mic and share your question? And I would just say go ahead and line up at the mic right here. If you have questions, go ahead and line up at the mic oh, so you guys can ask. Can you hear me? 
Hi, my name's Beth, I'm from New Jersey. Um, and uh, currently live in New York, but I'm, I'm talking about my past life as a farm to school advocate. And as you were talking about frozen being the answer, you know, that everybody has this perception that only fresh fish is good to eat. Um, even though food service directors in schools will have to deal with children's allergies, Getting fish into the farm to school movement is a, is a, a goal Absolutely. because I've watched 15 years of farm to school work in New Jersey. I now work for a company that sells food and 20% of our business is to schools. So they're the next generation. So I'm just saying put that yeah, out there. Yeah, may I just jump in with this really quick? How many people tried the hot dog? Yeah, so that hot dog has its weekly allowance, your weekly allowance of omega-3s. It's under a dollar, and it's made from the trim and the scrape meat from, um, from the processing of the salmon. We're working with the whole Kids Foundation because my big thing with Fed by Blue is we're not raising a generation of kids that are eating fish and seafood, and we're not raising a generation of kids that think they can work in the industry. There are a billion people on the planet that are connected in some way for their only economy to fish and seafood. And we're not getting kids in college going, I want to be on a water farmer. I want to work in technology for water farming. It starts in the schools. They have to taste it, get a, get a feel for it. And I believe, honestly, I believe it's in a hot dog. Like, I mean, if it's a way, if there are ways where we, it's never going to be the center of the plate filet that's expensive, it's not going to be what we're selling to Whole Foods, but we've got to figure out these alternatives and get them into the kids' hands. And I agree with you, allergies are somewhat of an issue, but I mean, most people will say they're allergic to it when they just don't like it. So the question really is just going to be, let's get it in there and let's get it in a way that's familiar to them, and then we can build a, a new generation that's going to believe in the power of blue food. Do we have another question up there? Just to add, add to that, um, we uh, became a certified B Corp several years ago and uh, joined, uh, uh, I guess, an Yvonne Schwinard uh, uh, prompted uh, agency called 1% for the Planet. And through 1% for the Planet, um, we uh, donate to uh, salmon friendly environmental causes. But we also have a program in house called Until We're All Fed. And what we do is we donate uh, highly nutritious seafood, the same stuff that we would sell to David, to people in need. And one of the groups in need that we donate to are to uh, um, schools in lower income neighborhoods. And they use the seafood for school lunches. But uh, it's also, I think, I think it's got good long term business ramifications because we're turning people that probably wouldn't ordinarily uh, entertain eating seafood into seafood eaters. We also work with culinary institutes in the, in the same way because if we catch them uh, when they're uh, going through their training, they're more inclined to uh, be supportive later on. So, hi, I'm from Boston. I'm the publisher of Edible Boston. And in the Boston area, we have lots of opportunities to get, um, like, uh, fish shares, weekly delivery, or you can buy it. And it's, it always comes frozen. And I, I have to tell you, I want to get behind this. But every time I try to defrost fish, it is very wet. And I know this is kind of granular, but can you, as the chef, please explain to all of us <laughs> newbies, maybe to frozen fish, please tell us how to properly do it. Because it, it like seeps, and then it, does, it feels spongy. And I want, to, I feel like I've ruined it because it's supposed to be better. So can you explain maybe? Yeah, I can talk about that. We don't use a lot of frozen fish, but I know how to cook it. Um, so when you freeze anything, it kind of breaks down the cell structure a little bit and a lot of water comes out. Um, depending on the handling of the fish too, if it was handled overly wet, we advocate very much for dry handling of fish so it doesn't get exposed to so much water. It can be a little better. Um, but it's really simple. I mean, you just dry it off. Basically, I mean, I, we would wrap it in a towel, a uh, paper towel, let it be in the fridge for a little while and get some of that residual liquid out. Um, and adding a little bit of salt previously to cooking helps as well, where if you kind of pre-season it and let it sit as well, it'll kind of dry out the outside of the, the fish and it'll sear better. Super hot pan, too. Just on, on the defrosting, because we sell through our, our uh, direct-to-consumer channel and it's exclusively shelf stable or frozen fish what we instruct our customers to do is to put a slit in the vacuum pack 
put the vacuum pack in, in the fridge in a container and thaw it out overnight. Uh, we discourage them from uh, defrosting them with a microwave. Mm. And, 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 and one other thought, and this, this relates to properly frozen, getting a little, a little bit scientific here. If you freeze seafood, and this probably applies to uh, anything at very low temperatures, the crystals tend to be small and not sharp. When you freeze seafood, in a low temperature, you get these large pointy crystals. What they do is they puncture the cell walls of the protein, and that's what causes it to be soft and mushy. So there's a big difference between properly frozen and improperly frozen seafood. Sounds like going back to where you get your fish. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eileen, I'm a new edible publisher. And one question that didn't come up with the meat thing is like, what is the pushback from the big lobbying for like big meat, the corn people that feed, feed, um, feed the cows when they want to do, I know this is, I know you're fish, but there are commercial fishermen that don't want to make the changes and they have, some of them get federal subsidies and some of them, you know, have a big lobbying machine behind them and I don't know what kind of pushback is or how you handle that, or you just motor through or, are they mean? I mean, what, ha what happens when you, you bump up against that? Well, I can speak a little bit about the sort of larger fishermen, smaller fishermen problem. It's a tremendous issue. Um, there's so many fewer small fishermen and they're under so much more pressure than they've ever been before. Um, I had most of my small fishermen, and I use some people actually fish with a fishing pole, um, went out of business just recently for the summer because fuel prices doubled. And when diesel's $6 a gallon at the dock, your model just doesn't work with a 25-foot boat. Um, but there's also a lot of consolidation in the industry where it's just becoming more expensive. And if you can't afford a million-dollar boat and a la crew to, to fish it and for it to be out of service for quite a bit of the year, um, it's really hard to make a living in the industry. And I think so much of the problem is that people aren't becoming, just like we have the issue with farmers, people aren't becoming farmers anymore, people aren't becoming fishermen anymore. It's one of the things I worry about with aquaculture taking over so much of this space, where um, what's the avenue for somebody who um, has a small boat and wants to fish at least for part of their living? Um, sometimes they're, they're being pushed out. I mean, I, I would only just say that I think that the, the feeling from water farmers that I talk to, and this is across multiple, multiple species, first and foremost, um, this is the year, according to the UN, they designated it to be the year of the artisanal fisherman and water farmer. So, and more volume globally comes from those small boats. So that's number one. But we know that there are issues globally around things like the Senegalese um, have sold out their fishing licenses to large Chinese fishing boats. And then the Senegalese fishermen who's fishing line and, you know, um, hook and line can't actually, the fish aren't coming to the shore and they're not able to then fish for their supper or fish for their, to sell it into their markets. So there's, there's a lot of conversation about what has happened in the high seas, what's happening with licenses and concessions and how to protect those spaces through things like MPAs, so marine protected areas, so that there's one great example, and, um, and we'll tease it up. I'm going to do an Ed Talk tomorrow, and I'm going to show you a story about what happened when a group and a community protected a one-mile radius and how much more fish there was to be able to fish in the surrounding area. So we have these opportunities. We know better to be able to protect these things, but we also need to align. It's, it's not an argument. There is there is no wild versus farmed. You know, one organization in the United States has spent a billion dollars, so that you know, a billion dollars in the last decade building a campaign wild versus farmed. And the reality is that we're going to need everything. We're going to need it all for 10 billion, you know, for all, for all of these people that are going to be on the planet. And it's going to take the entire food system. And no one ever sits at a restaurant and says, is that ribeye wild caught or farmed? It's the only one that you ask for that you have a consumptive entitlement to wild resources and the fish can't grow fast enough. So no one's going to take farmed out of business, I mean wild out of business. It's going to be in tandem. I mean, I envision a plate 20 years from now where you'll go to the sushi restaurant and you'll have, you're right, some farmed seafood that's responsibly raised, that's doing all of the right work. And you're probably going to see plant-based seafood. 
because that's going to be kind of part of the ecosystem and cultivated, all these labbed things, that's likely not going to go away. And then you're going to have a beautiful wild piece of tuna that's a small part of that. That's, do you see what I mean? All part of a thing that ladders up to what the future is and what support fish and seafood will have in the overall space of the future of our food system. But it's going to take all inputs to feed everybody. So I wish we had the luxury, but I promise you, we have to farm it right. We've been farming for thousands of years, and just like we're seeing the shape of change around how to farm corn well and how to grow cattle well, it, the industry will catch up, and it's your writing about it and not saying it should always be wild that's going to make the industry change just like Edible Communities has already done. You've watched that shift, so help us do it because that's what's needed. It's not going to go away. We'll eat up the ocean. We'll eat up our waters otherwise. We have to have both. When it comes to farming fish, can you talk about maybe the parameters, what healthy farm fish looks like and what's best for the environment, if that makes sense? Well, I think when, when I started in the industry, and this was before the the World Wildlife um, Fund had actually formed um, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. There's one now that's US-based called Best Aquaculture Practices. Nothing existed except for Seafood Watch. And they were a hard red. Everybody knows Seafood Watch, red, yellow, green. They were a hard red. And we put together, there were a group of us, and we put the, all the NGOs around the table and we said, look, if you were ever going to endorse a farmed fish, fin fish, what would be the first thing that you would say of those attributes? And the number one thing they said was how you feed the fish. Because it, it, fish eat other fish, depending on the fish that you want to raise. And salmon is usually the one you all hate. So, I mean, salmon's done the good things and the bad things in the industry and created a narrative around farmed fish. And the reality is that in the wild, a salmon will eat somewhere between 10 pounds and 15 pounds of feeder fish. Mackerel, herring, sardines, all those oily fish that eat the krill and the algae that give you the omega-3s you want out of a salmon. And when I started 15 years ago, the average what we call fish in, fish out ratio was four to one. So the big commodity farms would take all of those feeder fish, grind them up into fish meal and fish oil, form it into pellets, and feed the fish on the farm. And what the NGOs said was that you can't do that. You can't feed people salmon just because they love it, mom, and deplete the rest of the ocean the need for all those feeder fish, right? Birds eat them, marine mammals eat them, we should eat more of them, but we don't like them because they're too strong. So we've figured out ways through microalgaes, um, through all kinds of different ingredients, pea proteins and, and things that are really nutritive, to basically give the salmon a meatless Monday. And this nutritive diet means that they don't have to eat all of those feeder fish to be healthy. And, and, and as the more we have those insect diets and, and alternative feed models, the more sustainable it will be. So number one is, how do you feed your fish? The other thing is pen densities, that's kind of easy to fix. Put less on the, on the farm. You've talked about whether it's, um, whether it's uh, stocks of cattle that are in one area, um, feedlots or others. The more you put in, the more disease there's going to be. So most responsible farmed fish is 2% fish to 98% water. Great farms that are ocean raised have less fish than the fish are in schooling when salmon school together. There's less fish on a farm by standard. You can't touch wild stocks. You have to have good marine mammal policies. You're not allowed to have escapes. They're double netting systems now. You can't use antibiotics. You can't use chemicals. It's all the same things you expect out of good farming. And full transparency that they can trace it from one piece to another. Thank you guys so much. We are at time right now. Um, do, you want to, do you want to take one more question? OK. We're going to take one more question over here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amy O'Neill Haug from Edible Alaska. And I, I guess my question is, how do you avoid blue washing? We've all been dealing with green washing. And how, how do you avoid um, the, just telling the story of, of uh, aquaculture in a way that doesn't communicate the difference between uh, aquaculture and wild farmed fish? And if wild farm fish is so 
um, good for the planet and good for the people, why not communicate its source on the packaging in some kind of proud way, the way a wild caught fish might also be? And they are. I just don't think that you're seeing it enough yet because, I mean, Whole Foods only has certified four farmers in the world to supply them with Atlantic farm salmon. So it's early. And what's the name it's of that early. label? Like, what would you call it, I guess? Well, I mean, they, I mean, on that label, so I, this is one of the questions, too, for the beef industry, was how much real estate do you waste when the consumer doesn't know what those certifications and recommendations mean? So that's the question I think we all have to solve, is that they don't know. And I can tell you less than 0.01% of the American population knows Seafood Watch. So that's an issue. I think, um, I think for you in Alaska, and, and, and given the issues with salmon farming in British Columbia, and, and certainly Dane can speak about this, there are areas of the world that should not be farmed that should be protected like Yellowstone National Park. And there is no reason why anybody needs to farm a salmon in waters where we know that there have to be the preservation of the wild salmon stocks. So that's, that is off the table. And, but you can have an aquaculture story with barnacle foods and be able to talk about um, amazing multitropic systems with shellfish and with um, kelp and seaweed, where we don't have to have an aquaculture. Every time you talk about water farmers, you don't need to worry about the salmon piece. Just talk about the important work that's going on the water with all of these other farmers. We can take salmon off the table and be able to show a regenerative food system with zero inputs with the farming that you're already doing around seaweed in Alaska. So it's, it's Absolutely. all Absolutely. I guess my question is more about labeling and calling aquaculture what it is on the packaging so that... I mean, ours says consumer. it. It shows the farm. If you flip the hot dog package over, we show the farm in the Arctic right on the package. It's no, I mean, we're not trying to hide who we are. And I don't think that there's, um, and, and any labeling in the United States requires that you have origin, farmed or wild, and species. So the US, the, the US government, uh, the FDA, already requires that you put farmed salmon from, farmed Atlantic salmon from. It's on all the labels in every fish case in the United States. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Uh -huh.